Welcome back to chapter 17, where our primary focus is going to be on the details of a star's spectrum and how it can tell us about the different types of stars that exist and how we figured all of that out. Now, we start by reminding ourselves that back in chapter 5, we learned that the sun and all stars have an absorption spectrum. It took until 1814 for someone to be able to write down details of the sun's absorption spectrum after sending sunlight through a prism and seeing the dark lines that were missing. Now this might seem like it's a pretty impressive feat, but imagine doing that same thing, but instead of using the big bright sun, you do it for a single tiny star in the nighttime sky. It took 50 years for someone else to be able to do that, but Sir William and Lady Margaret Huggins identified dark lines in the spectra of other stars. And they recognized that other stars have very similar patterns to the sun, but they are not identical. So they saw that the same elements that we knew existed in the sun existed in the other stars too but that some, some of those lines were more strong than others, and there was differences that could be determined. And so in the 1880s and the 1890s, a group of women called the Harvard Computers, because they were people who computed things, and they're shown here in the picture, they analyzed a huge amount of stellar spectra. They were looking for lots of different things, um, but one of the major breakthroughs was a catalog of different types of stars. Now, the two people I'm going to focus on for this uh, brief reminder of history are Wilhelmina Fleming and Annie Jump Cannon. They are not the only members of the Harvard computers, uh, and they are not the only women who were working on astronomy at this time, but they were the ones who contributed the most to identifying different types of stars. So Wilhelmina Fleming was one of the first people that Henry Pickering hired for this group of um, data analysts. And she was able to look at a star's spectrum and decide that it fit into a category, either category A or B or C, down the alphabet through about M or N or O. And so she would look at a category and decide, okay, these really, um, these really strong absorption lines tell me that it's really a B type star or these really strong absorption lines tell me that it's really an F-type star, and she would put them into categories. Annie Jump Cannon followed up about 10 years later and revised this system once we had more information about these stars. Wilhelmina Fleming was only looking at the spectral lines and not any information about their temperatures or peak wavelength, but Annie Jump Cannon went back to these same categories and added that information about temperature and put those categories in order from the hottest type of star down to the coldest type of star. So instead of alphabetical order, like would have been really convenient for us, we have instead a kind of weird order based on the alphabetical categories that Wilhelmina Fleming created and the revised order based on temperature that Annie Jump Cannon put together we end up with the letters from hottest to coldest, top to bottom, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. It's all over the place. It's kind of weird. You do not have to mem memorize the internal order. But on the left here, we are showing the kind of data that Wilhelmina Fleming was able to look at, just the spectral lines, not the curves themselves. And on the right, we have something similar to what Annie Jump Cannon would have had access to. The fact that the star on top here, which ends up being an A-type star, peaks over in the blue and purple. It's a hotter star. And the star on the bottom, which peaks in maybe the um, green, is a colder star. I'm putting those in order that way. So we have all of these stars. And here is the order, um, much more simply laid out. O stars are the hottest, and when we are talking about stars during the normal part of their life, we will have a term for this in a couple of videos called the main sequence, but when we are talking about stars living their normal turning hydrogen into helium life, O stars have the most mass, they have the largest size, 
They are the hottest, and because they are the hottest, they are also the bluest. On the other end of the spectrum, M stars have the least amount of mass of standard stars. They are the smallest in size. They are the coldest and therefore the reddest of all of these star types. You don't have to memorize the internal order. It's probably worth writing down at least once in your notes, but it is important to know the extremes. When I refer to O stars, I need us to recognize that I'm talking about the hottest and bluest and biggest stars. And when I refer to M stars, I'm referring to the smallest and coldest and reddest of the types of stars. It may also be worth uh, writing down that the sun is a G type star. If we had to look at all of these colors, we might have guessed that the sun being yellow and not too blue or red um, might fall into that category, and it is a G type star. Now, this method and these particular letters, by rearranging the order and combining some of those categories, we get this set of seven categories. That worked for a hundred years. But we had to add a couple of categories recently. Now, I want you to stop and think. I know the slide doesn't say pause and think, but I'm asking you to. I want you to stop and think. If we are adding new categories, does it make the most sense? So common sense, critical thinking. Does it make the most sense that what we were missing were stars that were even hotter than O stars? Or were we missing stars that somehow fit in between the categories we already had? Or were we missing stars that were way colder than M stars? So pause and think about that. Think about not just what your answer is, but why. Give me an explanation or give yourself an explanation for why that makes the most sense to us. Okay. If we think back to the previous video, we said that stars are brighter when they are hotter. That would suggest O stars are the brightest. And they are hotter when they are bigger, which suggests that O stars are still the brightest by a lot. When we think about stars that all of a sudden we have been able to discover, what we might start to understand is it's because they were stars that were too dim for us to recognize before we got better telescopes, over a hundred years of telescope technology innovation. So the categories that we had to add were for objects that were colder and smaller and dimmer than M stars on the small end of the spectrum. And these objects aren't even stars at all. So in 2009, we finally had technology good enough to be able to de detect very dim, small objects that were too low mass to be a star, but they had too much mass to be a planet. These objects are called brown dwarfs, and they get additional categories L, T, and Y. So O, B, A, F, G, K, M, L, T, Y. Now, stars, to be called a star, and we'll revisit this in the next module, to be called a star, you need to be turning hydrogen into helium in your core. Brown dwarfs don't do that. They go through this, the first step of proton-proton chain fusion, turning hydrogen into deuterium, and then that's it. That's all that they have available to them because of the amount of mass and the temperature of their core. The fact that they're doing anything in their core means that they aren't just gas giant planets like Jupiter, which is not producing its own energy in the core. And that puts them as the kind of gray area between higher mass objects, which would be called stars, and lower mass objects, which would be called planets. Brown dwarfs are the in-between. Now, the remaining slides that I want to finish up chapter 17 with are just a couple of additional comments on what we can do with a star spectrum. Because we've determined now that a star spectrum can actually tell us about what type of star it is. 
And as a reminder from chapter 5, we know about the Doppler effect as a way to tell if a star is moving towards us or away from us. What we can also do by tracking an individual star from one year to the next, from one decade to the next, and so on, is we can actually track the sideways motion as well. This is called proper motion. It's the motion sideways across the sky. And it takes a long time for us to notice this. This set of pictures is a diagram for the Big Dipper, where 50,000 years ago, the Big Dipper would have had a really weird looking shape compared to what we're used to. And 50,000 years from now, the Big Dipper will continue to have a kind of strange shape. Because although most of the stars are moving in one direction together to the left, the farthest star out at the edge of the handle and the farthest star to the right, the edge of the scoop, they are actually moving to the right. And so over time, they shift relative to the stars around them. Proper motion will eventually change all of our constellations. We may just not be around to see that. The other thing to comment on in terms of motion and especially using Doppler effect is that the width of a spectral line can actually tell us about a star's rotation. If a star is not moving, all of the light comes towards us without any kind of Doppler effect or with the same overall Doppler effect. But if a star is rotating, then some part of that star is moving towards the telescope while a different part of the star is moving away from the telescope, and we get part of the light blue shifted and part of the light red shifted, and it just kind of spreads out and smears the spectral lines. This is included in our slides mostly to make sure we understand that the Doppler effect is a tool in our toolkit, the way that a screwdriver or a hammer might be in a, our physical toolkit. And it can be used in a lot of different circumstances that require it. So hopefully with this uh, video and the previous one, in chapter 17, we kind of remind ourselves of a lot of different topics that we introduced in chapter five, but now with a focus on how astronomers are actually using that key fundamental physics that we introduced in the previous module. So I will see you in the next video where we explore chapter 18. See you then.